No, I agree. I mean, at the moment, I don't think they're covered by the 1951 convention, and I think people will be very reluctant to see to change that convention because once you reopen it, you, you, it's a real Pandora's box. Uh, so people will probably leave it. So the question is, do you need a new convention, or can they be covered by existing legal instruments about protection of civilians in general, protection of people's human rights and basic rights and so on? And that's a, an open question which we haven't really discussed yet. I mean, the issue of... Of, of immigration is a whole other sort of, I mean, I, I mean compensating immigration to allow for res, in, responsibility is, uh, is one which I think might be difficult to negotiate, <laughs> if I can put it that way. But it's a, per, it's a perfectly fair point in another sense. Yes. Any more questions? Come on, there must be someone left. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Robert Egnell from Stockholm Centre for Strategic Studies. Now, a rather sensitive issue is the use of military forces for these types of uh, emergencies. Now, it would be really interesting from here to hear from you if the military was involved in these operations. To what extent do you have a rough estimate in terms of percentage? Did you see any problems or certain positive aspects coming out of that? Uh, thank you. I could try. Okay, go on, John. This is a <laughs> diplomatic well, we, difficult no, issue. We, I mean, we spend a lot of time sort of thinking about that, that particular issue. Um, because the relationship between military forces and security forces in a conflict zone and the humanitarian operators is a very delicate and difficult one. Uh, and basically, we, you know, we are trying to keep our distance from all such actors in order to remain in, uh, in independent, impartial, neutral and simply acting on the basis of need. So in conflict situations, it becomes very difficult, and we would always much prefer the military to stay away. I mean, they have to do what they have to do and maybe create an environment where we can work. Um, but we don't want to, them to be doing humanitarian operations because that prejudices the whole nature of what we're trying to do. In natural disasters, it's rather different, of course. Uh, we would still say, as a matter of principle, that um, it's much better if humanitarian relief operations are conducted by civilian actors but, of course, there are very often situations where the military are the ones who have the assets and the speed of response and so on to deal with situations. Pakistan earthquake was a, was a good example. Um, the, the, the current uh, emergency in Pakistan is being dealt with largely by the Pakistani military um, acting as relief operators, although this, the international response is civilian. Um, in Myanmar, the, the, the response there to the uh, emergency was... Well, it was a mixture of all sorts of things, but it was very largely military-led because it's a military regime, so it was a very natural thing for them to do. Um, and I think they did it as best as they could. They weren't experienced at it. They weren't particularly good at it, um, but they were doing their best, I think, in the circumstances. And actually, the private sector was also uh, recruited as well and did a, quite a remarkable job in some ways uh, in Myanmar. But in general, it does pose problems. So our attitude is one of uh, the military should be the last resort, uh, particularly when there's a conflict situation, if, if it's a natural disaster and they have, have assets and speed which no one else can deliver, fine. Um, but if not, let's try and use uh, civilian actors wherever possible and keep the military out of it. Yes, sir, Hassan. Uh, yes, uh, I do agree with the John Holmans that the military should be the last resort to be used in times of necessity. But uh, in case of Bangladesh, what is the reality? because in Bangladesh, natural calamities are regular phenomena. And uh, uh, in Bangladesh, we have a sizable military, and we spend a lot of money uh, uh, for, to maintain this military. And uh, 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 for the last 35 years, we don't have any conflict with any, any neighboring countries or with any other country. So we are spending a lot of money. So our attitude, yes, we want to tackle the situation through civil administration and through the community. But at the same time, we want to use in times of necessity the experience and capacity of the military, and that has been the case of in Bangladesh. In 1998, uh, this was time, I mean, when two thirds of the country went underwater. Uh, the relief and rehabilitation program uh, was carried out by the government, mainly through the civil administration and by the community. But military uh, also was, I mean, uh, capacity of the military was also used, and that gave a lot of, I mean, good result. And in, in 1991, even we got assistance from the foreign militaries, uh, from US military, and that was great help also. Uh, Surin. Yeah, sorry, you first. You first, Lenny first, please. <laughs> 
Go on, Mary. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. You know, I just uh, want to say that uh, we've had a practical um, situation uh, using the military. And this is a country where we've had so many coup d'etat, and um, the military did not have a very good reputation. So getting them mixed up in a civilian operation was uh, quite a challenge uh, for the government. But the military saw it as an opportunity to clean up their image. And, um, in, and practically speaking also, there were areas which were marooned. And um, we had to use the military to drop food and uh, also to parachute in uh, to help evacuate to. So in a sense, it's not a, an either or situation. It, it, it's what the <coughs> situation uh, calls for. Uh, in the process, uh, the military uh, built fences uh, with the population. They took games, they were playing football with them. Uh, that was a, a, a positive side. And then uh, also we used a lot the military uh, engineers to put bridges uh, across uh, places to uh, improve access in the short run um, and things like that. So I will say different horses for different courses. You, as a nation, uh, you, you use whatever you have. And I agree with you, uh, Honorable, that uh, a lot of money is spent on the military. And uh, they better dig holes uh, which can be used as wells later or if they have to build a bridge, integrate uh, it into the development plan, let them build the, in practicing how to put up daily bridges. So the bridge is really, they don't tell them I said this, but I've had these ideas since the seventies, you know. <laughs> so uh, this is it. Uh, the military in our countries use a lot of resources and they better be part of the package of improving the quality of life of the people, whether in time of disaster or even in normal times. Only they should agree that they will not be involved in governance. That's all. So you may not have expected that response, eh? Final <laughs> yes. word to Shireen, and then we're yes. going to wrap up our, yes. our discussion. Uh, 